Just a quick breather before we dive back in. When I started playing Hunt Down the Freeman, I was embarrassed at how much I sucked at the combat. I just kept thinking to myself, I cannot be this terrible at Half-Life. But one of the unintended benefits of splitting this review into two parts is I've received comments that shed light on exactly why the combat is so terrible. Most of the game's enemies have been recycled directly from Half-Life, and from what I've been told, the Half-Life games play like Doom. You are extremely fast and you have a wide variety of powerful but situational weapons. The enemies are designed to be fought by dashing around a level strategically using weapons to fit each situation. Hunt Down the Freeman, in contrast, plays like Call of Duty. Your movement speed sucks, your weapons are all weak conventional sidearms, and the action is meant to be methodically clearing out stages. So when enemies from the original Half-Life are recycled in Hunt Down the Freeman, they completely break the game because they were designed to be fought with abilities and tools that Bitchel just flat out doesn't have. It's Duke Nukem forever all over again, completely mismatched mechanics because to hell with it. Anyway, the game dumps you into yet a third dock stage where you once again run around an empty map trying to figure out what to do. You're supposed to head for a cargo ship at the end of the docks, but a combine helicopter chases you the entire way. So if you're at death's door from still not getting a damn health pack, tough shit. What? You can swim perfectly fine everywhere else in the game, but in this one level, touching the water kills you? So you've got to make a series of careful jumps over insta-kill water with a platforming system that barely- SON OF A BITCH! Long past my last nerve, I opted to trigger no clip and just friggin' fly to the exit. The first time I got here, the game faded to a black screen, and then stayed there until I died. <laughs> Yeah, that's another recurring bug. The game will just regularly fail to load the next level. The second time I got to the exit, some soldiers spawn, yet another scripted event that failed the first time around, and it looks like the game is finally GARBAGE! The third time the level finally ended! Mitchell, Nick, and Sniper Guy are finally on a ship. Only took about five hours of no plot to find one. Nick warns the crew that Mitchell is cursed, and every person of authority they've run into has died. He's cursed. Whoever is at the top of his command dies. Yeah, so? Every character we've run into has died or just vanished off screen. Wouldn't you blame the sudden deaths of all your allies on the fact that you're badly losing a war, or if you're paranoid, suspect Mitchell is killing commanders to rise in the ranks before your mind jumps to friggin' voodoo? The point here is that the G-Man is manipulating events to get Mitchell into a position of power, but this twist is presented in probably the dumbest way possible. Yes. Mitchell. Uh, the meaning is a gift from God. For others, who is like God? Or perhaps you are God himself. Did the ship's captain just ask if Mitchell is literally God? Well, he's an author insertion fan fiction character. He might as well be. It's worth mentioning at this point that Mitchell here is the brother of Adrian Shepard, the fan favorite protagonist of Half-Life Opposing Force. This relationship has zero bearing on the game's plot, it's just here because the game is bad fanfiction. After a brief shootout, which runs like crap because the frame rate shits itself and levels with AI partners, the captain dies and Mitchell is put in charge of the ship. The game skips ahead three years and dumps a boatload of exposition from Half-Life 2. The Combine are harvesting Earth's resources, keeping the human race enslaved in giant walled cities and brainwashing and assimilating humans into their army. Since the Combine have a powerful air force, Mitchell heads to Alaska looking for some weapons to fortify his ship. The game drops you into a cave that you navigate by picking up the one flare the game gives you and tediously throwing it over and over again until the pick up button stops working and you're left a bumble through darkness. I tried just holding the flare in front of me to use as a makeshift flashlight, but the damn thing blocks out your view. So the three year time skip hasn't done dick for the level design. Once you get out of the cave, the real absence of fun begins. The game dumps you into a massive snow map so big and so damn barren it could have been generated in no man's sky. All you do is wander around massive fields where everything looks the damn same, trying to figure out where you're supposed to go. Half the landmarks are red herrings. You have to figure out how to pass through a wall early in the level and most of the other walls don't do shit. The uneven terrain can have you take fall damage and die for walking over an innocuous hill. The only hint you get for navigation is a blizzard will whip out of nowhere and kill you if you wander too far out of bounds, which is just on you to guess where that is. It's seriously about a full freaking hour of wandering through a white screen while nothing else happens. 
until you run into the snipers! Partway through the stage, these robot snipers start attacking you. Not only are you wandering around trying to figure out where to go, you're wandering around trying to figure out where to go, having to dodge a never-ending stream of sniper bullets under constant threat of dropping dead. The game gives you a sniper rifle for this level, God knows why, since these sniper bots can't be killed, and there's a grand total of one small health pack in this entire level, and it's hidden in a dead-end path that I found on accident. You'll probably be forced to start the Alaska level over multiple times to save up enough health to get through this snowy hellhole. Long past my last crap to give, I just turned on god mode and let the bullets bounce off me, but the only way I can think of to beat this level without cheating is to save every few steps tediously inching your way through the level. Does this honestly contribute anything to the game beyond cheap padding? You don't do anything! How the hell do I get to this hop of this building? There's nowhere else to go. Oh, you can climb this white pipe here. Okay, now we're in business. I jump to the second pipe. I said I jump to the second pipe. I said I jump to the second pipe. There we go. And I can't move. Why am I still surprised? At the end of this white purgatory is a section where a bunch of searchlights wave back and forth over a map. If a single searchlight sees you, the power of Shazam just instantly disintegrates you out of nowhere. The problem is the game's textures blow so much ass that past a few feet you can't tell where any of the searchlights are looking. It's a blind guess, and what's worse is, I shit you not, the searchlights can spot you through solid walls. Seriously! I somehow beat this without cheating, but honest to god, I have no idea how you finish this level. You come to a rooftop that's entirely ensconced by invisible walls. Near as I can tell, you're supposed to climb this wall that the glitchy parkour mode refused to let me climb and drop down this tunnel that barely seems to exist. All I know is I no-clipped into a room that seems to have no entrance, and that's what ended the level. Mitchell encounters a Russian man named Boris and his daughter Sasha, who run a combine factory that makes disintegration robots. Boris reveals the combine have a slave force of children working the factory and no more human children are being born. For no real reason, this prompts Mitchell to launch into a long, pretentious, stilted, nonsensical rant about how all life is hopeless and pain because he's so edgy, you know. Hell, we enslave our own kind. We couldn't care less about an alien race. That's just nature playing out its own game. It's always been between predator and prey. That's the balance. You are a wise man indeed. Most of Mitchell's dialogue from this point on is just attempting to make him sound like the most awesomest edgelord man ever, and most of it just comes out sounding ridiculously stupid. You get a short, but actually pretty decent shootout fighting several Combine in the factory. They all die in a few hits, and you get a machine gun with plenty of ammo. And then BOOM! Suddenly I'm just on a boat! Hello? Where am I going? Yeah, does anybody know what I'm doing here? Oh, okay, you go to the bottom. One of Mitchell's men finds a crowbar, so they suspect that Gordon Freeman has resurfaced. Mitchell calls for his men to assemble and- ow! Oh! I have to wander through this damn ship again! Ah, screw it! Apparently it's been 20 years since the Alaska level. Mitchell rescued the child slaves from the factory and raised them into a private military that he trains and maintains aboard his boat. Why does this scene remind me so much of Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain? Disfigured commander motivated by revenge against the force that scarred him and killed his former team, rescues orphans of war, raises a private military on an aquatic base, main sidekick is a sniper since Adam's still kicking around. Shit, both games even start the same, the main character escaping a hospital. Hideo Kojima even gets a special thanks credit. What, did they just get bored ripping off Half-Life? The G-Man appears again and tells Mitchell that he has to go kill Gordon Freeman now, threatening to kill Mitchell's men when he tries to back out. Yes, the guy hasn't been mentioned for five or six hours, but two-thirds of the way through Hunt Down the Freeman, we finally start to hunt down the Freeman. The game at last has actual plot! Mitchell declares that they're heading to City 17, non-Half-Life fans have no idea what that means, and Nick says in no uncertain terms that this is a suicide mission. People will die. Are you willing to lose everything we have we don't own anything nick we just borrowed it even our own lives 
And this brings me to a problem that's been coming to a boil for a while. Hunt Down the Freeman's plot is friggin' depressing. The first entire half of the game is spent with a group of hopelessly overmatched soldiers desperately trying to survive with every named character implied to get slaughtered off screen. They've spent the last six hours bludgeoning home the point over and over and over again that the Combine are unstoppable, that nobody on Earth can do anything except put off dying for as long as possible. It's implied Mitchell's army hasn't accomplished a single thing against the Combine in 23 years. There's been a grand total of one joke in the entire game. There have been no hope spots, no levity, just bleak, hopeless misery. All this power does nothing but kill. Authority only to murder. Nothing but the power to kill my own men. And this time, nothing but endless torture. And now we're told that Mitchell's options are to drop dead or go on a suicide mission. It's called darkness-induced audience apathy. I just check out of even trying to get invested in the story because it's clear there's no point in caring about the characters. Hell, so much of the dialogue is either macho posturing or sprouting plot points that the people are barely characters in the first place. God help us. God will stay away from this one. Mitchell sneaks into a Combine City where you wander around trying to figure out where to go because there is so much unused space in this stage. This is the most visually appealing level in the game, probably because I'd bet money it was stolen from Half-Life 2. Eventually, Combines start chasing Mitchell with stun clubs and machine guns. At first I thought this level was rigged so that you don't take any damage because I got shot a lot and I didn't die, but then I took fall damage and the bullets hurt again, so the clubs are just glitched to make you immortal. At one point, I was completely pinned against a wall by Combine and I couldn't move until other Combine accidentally shot the guys who had me pinned. Brilliant! <laughs> Oh my god, this guy's gun doesn't exist! He can't shoot me and there's a gigantic red error message in its place! <laughs> Jeez and rice! <laughs> so Mitchell gets captured and taken to Boris who's here for some reason. Boris's daughter is a spy in the Resistance now, and she knows where Gordon Freeman is, and apparently they're all holed up in another Black Mesa building. Mitchell offers to have his army team up with the Combine to fight Gordon Free... What? And the Combine agreed to the team... Okay, back the hell up! What?! Mitchell is going to work with the Combine to kill the human Resistance. Mitchell, guy who's been raising an army for the past 23 years to fight the Combine who've enslaved all of humanity, is going to work with the Combine who brainwash humans into serving in their army. I just... Where do I start? Mitchell's army is tiny, pathetic, and absolutely dwarfed by the Combine. Why would the Combine bother joining forces with him to marginally swell their ranks for one mission instead of just killing or assimilating them like they do to all the other human forces? Even if the Combine accept Mitchell's dumb offer, what makes him think the Combine will let an army of known enemies go free after the mission is complete? If Mitchell's resigned himself to the fact that whether he hunts Freeman down or not, his men will die, why does he go for the option that involves slaughtering mankind's last hope against the Combine? Why are Mitchell and his men so gung-ho about screwing over the human race as much as possible on their way out? Does Mitchell really care about revenge on Freeman so much he's willing to doom the entire planet over it? If there is a human resistance, how come this is the first we've heard of it? Why isn't Mitchell a part of the resistance? He's content to float out in the middle of nowhere raising an army he did not accomplish dick for decades instead of joining the group that's actually working to save the planet? Mitchell convinces his men to come with him to City 17, promising a big battle against the Combine. Does nobody question it when they slaughter human soldiers on the Combine's behalf instead? Again, Hunt Down the Freeman is bad fan fiction. They wanted their original character to be the most awesomest guy ever. He's a villain working for the Combine, but he's also a badass rogue commander with a death wish who raises his own private army to fight the Combine. Never mind the fact that those two things are completely incompatible with one another, or that neither makes any sense in Half-Life setting. Mitchell isn't a compelling villain or a tragic hero. He's a regular hero who's just fucking stupid. The plot completely implodes and makes mincemeat of established canon to force a story where their custom character is the most awesome man alive. So Mitchell and the Combine attack a resistance base and this level is actually kind of fun. You make your way through a linear level fighting a reasonable number of well-balanced soldiers with plentiful ammo and there's only one climbing bit where the game was rendered unplayable. Holy shit a level that's decent! Oh look a hidden grate! Maybe I just found a secret path that leads further into the level! Or... maybe not. 
Then all of a sudden the game just completely gives up on having a story of any kind. Somehow the resistance base in the middle of a city just suddenly opens up into a swamp full of zombies and the game gives you a shitty shotgun that only fires two shots and takes ages to reload. It's like the game just abruptly decided to become a shitty survival horror game with so much wasted space you can't figure out where to go in this level. Also behold the amazing Diglett zombie! This enemy that got stuck in the ground and keeps leaping through the floor to attack me! The swamp just suddenly leads back to a city, which you wander through for about a minute, then that abruptly leads to a series of underground tunnels full of bugs, and then that suddenly leads to a sewer junction you have to climb, and then that suddenly just leads to a highway you have to drive down with a crappy motorcycle, and then that just abruptly leads to a giant doom fortress that's completely empty. It's like an hour straight of one random, completely unexplained filler level after another, with zero transitions and without a single word explaining why you're here. Just BAM! You're in a graveyard. BAM! You're in a sewer. BAM! You're on a highway. It's seriously like they just had five or six extra levels sitting around and couldn't be asked to write any more story around them. Pop quiz! In the motorcycle level, you're given a box of endlessly refilling grenades. How do you get through this destructible floor? That's right! You climb onto the chandelier, thus causing it to drop under your weight, which smashes through the floor while nuking the fragile ground with grenades doesn't do jack. So why aren't the respawning grenades even there, you stupid game? Also, there comes a point in the Doom Fortress level where you wash away in a water tunnel and I just completely froze and couldn't move. Turns out the level is supposed to end when you clear this tunnel. And it just, you know, didn't. Then it just smash cuts to Mitchell in a prison cell with no explanation of how he got there and you have to escape the resistance. This entails somehow getting past a group of armed guards blocking the exits with no weapons or means to attack because Mitchell won't just punch a guy. Eventually, Mitchell runs into Sasha and they have another terribly scripted conversation. I have a good memory. I remember everything. And I remember you saving those children. I always saw you as a hero after that day. You're talking to a villain, my dear. A hero inside of me died many, many years ago when I was young. Incidentally, Sasha gets my personal vote for worst voice actor in the game, and that's an accomplishment. Sasha reveals that she and her father had a deal with the G-Man, but before she can explain, she's shot by Sniper Guy! And they start running away only for Sniper Guy to leave Mitchell! Then the G-Man shows up and reveals the great secret from the start of the game. It turns out not Gordon Freeman was not actually Gordon Freeman. It was actually... No, it's Adam, the sniper guy. The G-Man eventually just sits Mitchell down and has a Harry Potter moment where someone explains the entire plot at once. The G-Man made a deal with Adam to have him impersonate Gordon Freeman and beat Mitchell to death, I guess just counting on Mitchell swearing blood vengeance on Freeman for attacking him in self-defense. He then made Mitchell a deal to help him raise an army in exchange for helping him kill Freeman someday. He also made a deal with Boris to keep him and his daughter alive after Alaska in exchange for installing Sasha as the Combine spy in the Resistance. I guess the G-Man just counted on Mitchell being a dumbass and never joining the Resistance and thus running into the real Gordon Freeman. Twenty years later, the G-Man sent Mitchell to kill Freeman. I guess he just hoped Mitchell would be a douche willing to kill the Resistance, and I guess he just also hoped he'd join up with the Combine, who I guess he just hoped would agree to work with him for literally no reason. Also, the Combine would know who Mitchell is before he goes off. He then, I guess, just hoped that not only would Mitchell never come close to the actual Gordon Freeman, maybe he had Boris intentionally send him to the wrong place, I don't know, but he also just hoped that Mitchell would somehow end up alone with Sasha away from the Combine's forces, then had Adam assassinate Sasha to pin it on Mitchell. From there, I guess he just hoped the Combine would get super mad at Mitchell, despite the fact he's also wiped out the Resistance on their behalf. Now the Combine are sending a huge army to kill Mitchell for revenge, which I guess the G-Man just hoped would happen, which will clear out City 17 enough for the real Gordon Freeman to do a vital mission in the city. Yes, the payoff to this 23-year-long plan that would have completely fallen apart if any of the main players had a functioning brain between them was to create one distraction to make the Combine leave a city for a few hours. Any questions? Maybe I have to be a Half-Life fan to understand, but are there not about 50,000 easier plans that G-Man could have gone with? He didn't need three separate deals and elaborate conspiracy to send Mitchell on an all-consuming revenge quest. He could have just picked out any guy in the Seven Hour War, told him I'll help you raise an army if you lead a crucial battle in 23 years, had that army attack a combine facility to draw them away from City 17. It's almost like the G-Man's entire plan was yanked out of the writer's ass to try and make it look like the plot makes a remote shred of sense after the fact. So, what now? And since our agreement is finished, 
You have our permission to die. No. You have got- You seriously did not just quote The Dark Knight Rises and expect to get away with it. Come on! The last level of the game, Mitchell is trapped on the prison island with waves of calm by attacking the building. You have to survive for 15 minutes until help arrives. There are two bridges on the bottom floor leading to the stage, and eventually I realize every single enemy that spawns in the level spawns on the left bridge. Enemies don't appear anywhere else on the map, so after you've cleared out the level once, all you have to do is park at the end of this bridge and every single enemy that spawns will march single file into your line of fire. You only ever need to move from this spot if you need to heal up or grab more ammo. This is what a total lack of giving a shit looks like. You're trapped in a small map for 15 minutes, there's a 0% chance of even a dumbass like me not figuring this out. There aren't even multiple enemy types or weapons, they just spawn endless waves of basic combine soldiers that die in like two hits with a single basic machine gun for the whole stage. This is so far beyond lazy! I know there are two secret cutscenes that play if you die on this level, but I refuse to let myself get killed on a stage this pathetic! Even for a game so unfinished that almost every level has a game-breaking bug, THIS IS EMBARRASSING! So Nick rescues Mitchell in a helicopter and takes him back to base, which is still staffed with an awful lot of evil considering how much this was hyped as a suicide mission. It's almost like that line was just thrown in because it sounded cool. Mitchell chases down Sniper Guy and shoots him, and judging by Sniper Guy's voice acting, he couldn't give a rat's ass. Mitchell, look, I can explain. You lied to me. No. Hold on. Mitch, please. You betrayed me. You used me. You fucked up my face. <laughs> you fucked up my face. That. That was the you are winner moment. The moment that cemented Hunt Down the Freeman in internet meme infamy. A script trying so damn hard to be dark, serious, and edgy punctuates its emotional climax with the most stupid and ridiculous line that you could imagine. You fucked up my face. They tried so hard to make Mitchell bad as they just wound around to being a complete farce. Case in point. I can explain. You have my permission to die. Oh, come on! You used that one already! There weren't any other iconic villain lines that you could shamelessly steal to make Mitchell sound awesome. Just think, if the game had come out a few months later, they could have stolen this. I know what it's like to lose. I feel so desperately that you're right. Yet to fail, nonetheless. Dread it. Run from it. Destiny arrives all the same. And now it's here. Or should I say... I am. So Sniper Guy dies and Mitchell says his men are going to Borealis, which means nothing to anybody who hasn't played Half-Life, and finally and mercifully, the game ends. Turn the ship. We're going to Borealis. Believe it or not, I actually know what Borealis means. One of Valve's writers leaked a script that was going to be used for Half-Life 3 before its production shut down. The game was going to revolve around a ship called the Borealis that can travel through time and warp reality. So this sequel hook was actually an attempt to warp Mitchell into the plot of Half-Life 3. Fat chance of that happening because HUNT DOWN THE FREEMAN IS INCONCEIVABLE GARBAGE! The game barely works. The basic platforming glitches all the time with more bears than I can count impossible to cross. The levels don't work, with multiple key scripted events failing to trigger and rendering levels impossible to complete. The level design is atrocious. Because almost every level has clearly been cannibalized from somewhere else, they're mostly empty maps where it's not clear at all what you're supposed to do, and you wander in circles until you trip over the way forward on accident. Even when the game works right, the gameplay sucks with a grand total of two short levels that are decent. You spend 
spend more time walking through the empty maps than doing any shooting. There are no puzzles, and the combat through the entire first half of the game is beyond infuriatingly unbalanced, sending you against massive waves of overpowered enemies with shit weapons and going hours at a time without health refills. The plot is a complete waste of time. It doesn't even start until after several hours of filler, it completely lacks any likable characters, it's too depressing to get invested into anything that happens, and it twists itself into grotesque and convoluted knots to force a shitty fanfiction story that feels completely scattershot and haphazard. You might get a kick laughing at how grim, dark, and edgy the story tries to be while being silly as all get out, but it is not worth trying to actually play the game just to laugh at people who can't write. The only redeeming things about the game are two short levels near the end that are tolerable, the cutscenes look pretty decent, and the G-Man's voice actor is actually pretty good, but otherwise, the entire game is a complete disaster, and the steaming dump it takes on gaming's most beloved franchise with the original developer's own endorsement makes Hunt Down the Freeman one of the biggest face palms in the industry. So how could a game turn out this badly? Well, once you find out what a bizarre development cycle the game had, the question becomes, how could it not? Most of the information that I have surrounding the game's development comes from the YouTubers Dread Dial, who worked on sound effects for the game and made a video shedding light on development, I Hate Everything, who voiced Nick and made a video publicly denouncing the game, Pyro Cynical, who voiced a few soldiers and made an extensive negative review of the game at launch, and Musical Antihero, a member of Sentinels of the Store who compiled all public statements and leaks regarding the game. On paper, the game was developed by Royal Rudius Entertainment, an indie studio of about five people that didn't actually program most of the game. Almost every aspect of the game's development, all the levels, the weapon models, even all the cutscenes, were farmed out to a small army of Half-Life fans who worked on the game primarily using Valve's modding tools. Royal Rudius didn't show anybody who worked on the game a design document. Nobody who worked on the game knew how it played, what mechanics they had to work with, or how their levels or content would fit in with any other elements or levels of the game. Every member of the dev team worked in total isolation with zero guidance or feedback from management or communication with other devs. I'd bet good money the game goes hours without any health packs because some devs thought the game had regenerating health and nobody told them otherwise. It's probably also why the game recycles and misuses broken Half-Life enemies. They thought the game would play like Half-Life, so they designed the combat encounters for Half-Life. Nobody knew what the story was either. I Hate Everything claims he's never set eyes on a script despite voicing one of the game's main characters. Someone at Royal Rudius would just call him on Skype out of the blue every now and then and feed him one line at a time. More than likely, the script was being made up as they went along, which probably explains why major characters drop out without explanation, why most of the game is padding with little to no story, and why levels continually just come out of nowhere. I Hate Everything also claimed that he was asked to voice his lines with an American accent, and then went back and did it with his natural English accent. And both takes were used in the final game, so Nick's accent fluctuates wildly from scene to scene. The only direction he claims he was given for his voice acting was, your words should make the audience cry. Like, that makes any damn sense. Several dev team members also claimed they hadn't been paid. I don't know if that was ever rectified or not. Multiple developers stepped forward to claim the game was stealing assets not just from the other Half-Life games, but from multiple other Source Engine projects. Although Mellow Online dug into the allegations for an article on Sentinels of the Store, and a lot of it looks like he said, she said upon closer inspection. Apparently there were stolen assets in the demo, and Royal Rudius claimed they were just placeholders. Gmod Towers and Black Mesa's developers think they stole assets and then patched them out. Mellow Online interviewed the game lead, Burkan Deniz Yaren, who provided proof that he had valid license agreements agreements and scripts. After launch, people rooted through the game's files and supposedly found content from Left 4 Dead 2 and Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl, among others, although some assets they claim just looked really similar. It's difficult to definitively parse out fact from fiction and what exactly has been used with permission. What is clear is that Royal Rudius responded to the claims of stolen content by deleting a lot of Steam comment threads, banning a lot of people on Discord, and fighting quite publicly with the Half-Life fan community on Twitter. The game's demo had absolutely nothing to do with the finished game, owing to being made by completely different people. Nobody on the dev team was given a build to work with or debug. They just submitted their work into a void to be thrown into the game. Dre Dial and I Hate Everything both claim that nobody who worked on the game knew about the game's dire state until the launch party. Royal Rudius's inner circle were the only people who tested the game. When the people who worked on the game finally got a look at the finished product, they were mortified and everybody begged Royal Rudius to delay the game's release. The game was pushed out anyway to meet investors demands. 
yeah, about that. Hunt Down the Freeman languished on Greenlight for weeks before very abruptly being accepted onto Steam, with most suspecting that it was pushed through by bots. The game tried to find funding on Indiegogo and, for real, only raised $12, so mysterious investors eventually stepped in to fund the project. Mysterious investors who, Dredial suspects, forced the game to launch months before it was ready. The game also missed its release date five times as the developers spewed one dubious excuse after another, at one point claiming the game was delayed because Valve was QA testing it. Valve. QA testing. Something on Steam. R really? Oh, but somehow it gets worse. In spite of how terrible the game is, as many innumerable problems as you've seen in this review, the game was even more broken than this at launch. Way more models were missing, so you just see conga lines of giant red error signs through levels. There was no tutorial explaining how going prone or the dumbass platforming worked. The music wouldn't play, and it still drops out all the damn time. The save system barely worked, as saves would periodically corrupt and crash upon loading. Cutscenes would play multiple times or not at all because their triggers weren't set up correctly, you'd fail levels if a suicidal AI got itself killed, and single individual loading screens would often take up to five minutes. The game sucks now, it was almost literally unplayable at launch. The devs also claim the game takes 14 hours to beat on the game store page. It actually takes three and a half hours. The other ten are the devs estimate for how long you spend bumbling around trying to figure out what to do. Wait. The store page also tags the game for female protagonist. So that's why some people call him Bitchel. After the game released and bombed, Royal Rudius ran catastrophically terrible damage control, claiming they'd posted the wrong version to Steam, trying to play off the game's negative reception as just some salty fanboys, and two weeks after the game's launch, they whined in the forums that nobody in the media had contacted them for their side of the story because apparently it was other people's jobs to find out why the game was such a travesty. The devs' whining post also stated that Hunt Down the Freeman was originally going to be a fan film until they just decided to make it a video game. And that tells me all that I need to know. A random chuckle nuts thought, let's make a video game, why not, got a legion of devoted Half-Life fans to work on a fan project out of passion, and expected a good game to just magically materialize because he didn't think that management was a real job. At this point, it's a tale as old as time. Amateur rando who has no business being on a professional storefront gets on with no questions asked because Valve doesn't care. No different from minor ultra adventures, no different from shadow treachery cannot be tolerated. The only difference is that this time it happened to Half-Life, adding the legacy of gaming's most beloved franchise to the pile of things Valve doesn't give a shit about, a list which currently encompasses everything on Earth except their bank balance. After years of silence and stringing along desperate fans, Valve has implicitly confirmed that Half-Life is dead. You'll never get Half-Life 3, but Valve will gladly sell you this broken shambles to make a quick buck. This is how gaming's most beloved franchise dies. Not with a bang or with dignity, but with a pretentious edgelord and a fucked up face. Oh well, maybe now people can finally move on. You fucked up my face.